From the mystery cults of antiquity, to the witches' covens of the Middle Ages, to the Victorian magical societies, to the Wiccan circles of the mid-20th century, there have been groups of practitioners that have gathered and performed magic. They each have their own traditions and their own goals, and many claim to offer their members the secrets of true magic. Many still exist today. They're not hard to find, but should you want to? Hey folks, this is James, a.k.a. Threskiornis. Fans of the channel will immediately notice that I have gone and given into YouTube culture. YouTube keeps telling me that my video should be solving a problem or answering a burning question. But if you've spent any time on this channel, you know I absolutely despise hype and lowbrow cliches. Let's see if I can strike a balance between adding more appeal and being able to live with myself. Another thing fans of the channel might notice is that this video is really just the latest in our series on emergent magic, rebuilding our tribes through ritual and meaning. A book I wrote with the mighty Zentra L outlining our magical philosophy. This series of videos is covering that book chapter by chapter, and this one is on chapter six, Tribe. You can buy your own copy of the Emergent Magic book using the link in the description. Now, like I've said before, we've learned a lot since writing the book, and with this video series, you'll be getting some of our more updated and nuanced ideas on Emergent Magic, which we sometimes call EMK for short. But first, unlike a lot of YouTubers, I'm going to answer the question that is the title of this video. Should you join some kind of magical organization? In my opinion, yes, you should. I think the benefits outweigh the drawbacks. And we're going to spend the rest of this video talking about what you should be looking for in a magical organization, what you should be getting out of it, and what should make you run away as fast as you can. I'm also going to try and convince you to do the one thing even better than joining a group, starting your own. It's going to be hard finding a magical group that fits these, what I would think are pretty basic standards. And I'm going to piss a lot of people off here because most organizations do the things I'm about to tell you to avoid. But no group is perfect, not even our own the Order of Emergent Magi. Only you as an individual can decide what you are willing to tolerate and what you aren't. Let's start with, don't join any group that wants to limit the type of magic you do. There's a give and take here. If you join a group of Alexandrian witches, then you should expect they're going to be doing witchcraft based on Alexandrian sources. If they were upfront about it and you joined, you don't get to show up for meetings and be all disappointed they're not doing Golden Dawn rituals. The big problem comes when they tell you that you can't be doing Golden Dawn rituals on your own time. That's just controlling people and insisting on ideological purity. I've heard of groups that say you can't do magic with other people while you are part of their group, and that's a huge deal breaker for me. Sure sounds like they're afraid you'll find out other people aren't as shitty as they are. Your magical group should be accepting of other ideas. Once again, 
if you join the Ordo Templi Orientis and expect them to do the Kume rituals because that's what you're interested in this month, that's your fault. But you should at least be able to discuss other magical traditions with your peers without being ostracized. As long as you're not trying to always dominate the conversation or argue your ideas are always right. In the order of emergent magi, OEM for short, everyone is expected to have their own tradition or paradigm that they work in, or multiple ones if that's what they're into. We have developed group paradigms like the gutter bible, but no one is required to do gutter bible magic on their own time. How it works is we hold a meeting, which we call a sabbat, and everyone is invited to, though not required to, bring a ritual for the rest of the group to participate in. Everyone else accepts and adopts the paradigm of the ritual while we perform it. There's lots of reasons for people not to participate in a ritual at an OEM Sabbat. They're tired, they want to enjoy something else, they're preparing for their own ritual, but it should never be because you don't like the paradigm of the ritual being presented. When you go home, you may never work with that paradigm again, but while at the Sabbat, you give the presenter the respect they deserve. And who knows, you might learn something new, which is one of the main reasons to join a magical group in the first place. To learn from your peers, it, it just shouldn't be in a top-down way. It shouldn't be, you're the student, I'm the master. It should be by learning by example. Which brings me to another thing you should avoid, groups with grade systems. It should be no surprise that a bunch of Victorians, when they decided to make a magical organization, based them after the other social clubs they participated in, Freemason organizations. In them, everyone has a grade and is expected to work their way up the ladder by showing competence in certain knowledge and performing certain rituals. Later, New Age Wiccan witchcraft organizations, which took a lot from the ceremonial magicians of what's called the English Magical Revival, emulated those grade systems to a degree. It is, in my opinion, an awful, archaic way to run things, with the chief reason being the potential for abuse. When your superiors are the ones who decide who makes the cut, there are some people who want it so bad. They really want to get an A+. Plus. They really want that scratch and sniff sticker that says, Grape Job. And they're going to get taken advantage of. And these occult organizations have a long history of taking advantage of people financially and sexually. And this is why the OEM has done away with grade systems altogether. On top of that, in most of these organizations, it's the people who have achieved the highest grade that get to run things. And I don't know if you know this or not, but having some kind of supposed magical competence doesn't mean you're a good organizer and leader. That's the kind of thing that comes from monarchical thinking. The kind of people who believe in royalty those who believe that some people are just born better. It would seem patently obvious that modern magical organizations should have some sort of democratic structure. We all agree that democracy is a better way to run things, right? I know from experience that our traditional voting methods don't work well for small groups, like a lot of these magical organizations, but there should be some kind of consensus. Everyone should have an equal say. Everyone should be heard. Though that shouldn't be an excuse for letting assholes infect your group. If someone is repeatedly causing problems, chuck them. Another thing that would make the top of my list 
as nope out is if the first thing they ask you for is money, that's it, you're in the wrong place. I'm not against dudes per se, as long as they are completely transparent in how those dues are spent. In the OEM, we only collect money for events. Everyone chips in up front to rent the space and for food. That's it. No hidden fees, no yearly collections, and absolutely no tithing. Ultimately, the best magical organization is the one you make yourself. We've talked about this several times here and on the Old Scroll of Thoth podcast. It's really as simple as throwing a party, telling your friends, hey, let's do a magical ritual. It's a good bet if you're weird enough to be into magic, your friends are too. It can be simple. Make a sigil. Light a healing candle. Do some tarot or other divination. Just make sure everyone gets involved and I guarantee you, people will come back for more. You can pick a name, make rules, and other official stuff later. Though my advice is to make as few rules as possible. And pick a name at random. Letters picked out of a bag will work just fine. Another thing worth adding here, your group will eventually need to grow. People move away, lose interest, make other commitments. Eventually, your group will die if it does not get new members. And I'm not saying you should be openly recruiting. You should just be keeping an eye out for potential new members. Do not take randos off the internet. Do not put up a flyer at your local occult bookstore. You're not in this to form a cult, right? I can't think of anything more pathetic. The numbers should not matter, as long as you have a large enough group to do the things you want to do. For us, that means enough people interested so we can pool our money and rent a mansion once or twice a year. Your needs, especially starting out, will be smaller. And it's okay to do these things in your own home. We do that all the time with smaller local sabbats. How do you find people to join? We usually find new members when we go to festivals. That way we get to know them for a few days, determine if they're the right fit, and then invite them to the next event. We've also been known to throw a few public events for this purpose as well, such as seminars or tarot reading groups. And you could do the same. While you shouldn't be just picking up people at the local occult bookstore, it can be a good idea to teach a class and get to know folks over a few weeks or months. If festivals or occult bookstores don't appeal to you, many communities hold pagan pride events, but again, it's hard to get to know someone in that short of time. Just be careful who you invite to these things. There are a lot of raisin cakes out there who will spoil your fun. You have to be able to trust people when engaging in these sorts of activities. The ultimate benefit of this is not just sharing knowledge, not just having peer review of your own magical work. The real goal is to build a community, to have people you can count on, in and out of the magical circle, to make friends, to create a mutual aid society where everyone contributes what they can. That's true wealth. That's real magic. I have had members of my tribe come through for me when I was really desperate and had nowhere else to turn. You may also get to do things you've never dreamed you'd be able to do because your fellow magi inspire you to get there. Thank you so much for watching until the end. If you haven't yet, please like and subscribe. I'm always interested in hearing your thoughts in the comments and let me know what you'd like to see in future episodes. We're off to Egypt, November 13th. No promises, but I hope to put out another video before that. After that, it's 
Probably going to be a minute, but expect video and knowledge straight from Kemet. Thanks again for watching. I'll see you next time. Add your name to the Scroll of Thought by joining our Ko-Fi fundraising campaign. Ko-Fi subscribers will receive access to the extensive archive of Scroll of Thought podcasts, access to our private Discord server, special extended cuts of our videos, a 10% discount in our store on all Scarlet Ibis Apothecary items, bonus videos and other content, and a free three-card tarot reading every month for those who subscribe for $10 or more. Help me create more videos on the occult and spiritual history of ancient Egypt. Discover a magic that goes beyond the repeated platitudes of Victorian-era dilettantes and look into the true heart of the Western esoteric traditions.